Welcome back, and I am coming to you right now. Uh, this is Sunday night, or I guess it's Monday morning technically, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my latest article with American Greatness. Um, if you have been waiting for videos on Rumble, hopefully this will be on Rumble. There's a huge problem. I think it, is, it might be when you upload something to Rumble that's already somewhere else and they basically kibosh it. So I'm going to try uploading to Rumble first. But if you're not already subscribed to me on Library slash Odyssey or on BitChute, please do so now. Okay, I think those are, as of right now, the best alt tech alternatives, especially uh, both Library and Odyssey. They, they just have a lot more of a streamlined um, video streaming uh, setup. Uh, BitChute's also good. It just takes longer for videos to upload and uh, process. In any case, so this article is mainly about a real problem that could crop up for Kamala Harris, and I don't think it's entirely her fault. And I know that if you're sort of one of these partisan Democrats out there, you might think, well, why should I really read an article that's by somebody who's so biased against Kamala Harris? Because I, I've said, if you can go back, and this is something many people won't admit, you can go back, you can read a lot of the stuff I've written, you can, you can watch some of the videos I've made. I said at the beginning of the campaign, she was the worst possible candidate for the country. She was eminently unqualified to be president, but especially qualified to be a puppet of the Democrats and possibly to be a tyrant compared to some of the other candidates. So while there, there aren't almost any other candidates that were on the Democratic side, granted I did vote for Tulsi Gabbard, which also sort of is a it's one of the main angles where I, I really see an opposition to Kamala Harris because I did vote for for Tulsi Gabbard in the primary, which I'd never voted in any Democratic race in my life. Um, I think Kamala Harris was worse than almost any of the other candidates. Like, if, if you talk about Beto, if you talk about Pete Buttigieg, if you talk about, um, you know, Amy Klobuchar, Bernie Sanders, I, I think she was in many ways worse. But not everybody understood that and the people who did not understand that the most the people who had the, or or should i say the the people that understood that point the least are members of the media that continue to if they can hide her flaws which are just so obvious and and, and these are personality flaws these are flaws in her um just the way that she relates to people and there are also flaws in terms of her record, right? So if you're talking about a person who they have problems that they want to conceal from the voters, such as her reluctance to prosecute, uh, you know, some of these banks that were involved in, in the mortgage crisis. This is something that people like Jimmy Dore, who are progressives, really try to hold her account for, right? They, they don't want somebody who let Steven Mnuchin who was a major bank executive during the mortgage crisis, she did not prosecute him, even though California had jurisdiction over his bank. And they don't want somebody in office who is going to play patty cake with some of these bankers, right? So that that's people on the left. There's also people who bring up valid concerns about her, generally her record, uh, on social issues, she, she's extremely liberal, I would say. Now, now, a lot like the Republicans like to paint her as being this radical leftist. It's not really that the case because she has a voting record that they say, oh, she's the most left voting senator in, in, in the Senate. But that's not really what the metric says. It says generally she has a voting record that has the least common ground with Republicans, right? So that's a little bit different. Um, there, there are some issues where Republicans, if you really look at it, 
they will vote with the Democrats because they have common interests with them because they have, and these are not interests I would support in many cases, right? Such as when they pass budgets that I don't agree with. Um, and I think they just did, by the way. So, and, and I haven't been able to pay attention to everything, but um, yeah, I, I would generally say that the Republicans and the Democrats, sometimes you want somebody who's not going to vote with people on the other side of the aisle. On the other hand, if you're, if you're somebody who's only going to vote for bills in order to show that or, or vote vote for or against bills because you want to show that you're not the other guy, that's not what being a great uh, you know public res representative is, uh, you know, an elected official. You, you're not supposed to be in office generally in order to show that you are partisan, right? Um, but... Like I said, there is a time to be a critical of somebody like Kamala Harris, and then there's times to be fair. And I'm going to try to be fair here, even though it's very hard. So I wrote this article about the upcoming confirmation battle with Amy Coney Barrett. And so far as I know, it's going to keep going on, even though three of the Republican senators are, I guess, uh, they have... Um, they, they got COVID-19 just like Donald Trump. So if I remember correctly, those senators are Tom Tillis, uh, I think it was Ron Johnson, and um, I forget the the third one. The third one is also on the House Judici is on the Senate Judiciary Committee. But in any case, these are somebody actually mentioned it today that it was one of the guys. Um, Oh, Mike Lee of Utah. So I don't believe that any of those people is going to die from COVID-19. They all seem to be like, first of all, if you are a member of the Senate or the House, you have access to excellent medical care. Unfortunately, most Americans have like that. This is a real problem. Even as somebody like me who opposes universal health care, I think it's ridiculous that elected officials get a better set up than, than the rest of the country, right? Why should they get better conditions than everyone else? Because people voted for them? That, that shouldn't be a perk of office. But to focus on Harris, she's going to have to be in one of these confirmation battles over Amy Coney Barrett. And I started it out by saying that, um, you know, FDR, for example, he had a major flaw that he wanted to... Uh, cover up and that was his polio um, issue okay so it's not well known but or it is it is well known today but at the time it was generally known that um, it was it was shown that he was he would be able to stand up and things like that now this is a rare photo of the, at the time of him being in a wheelchair uh, with um, I guess that's his granddaughter um, you see him here grasping a railing. So, and, and this is this is interesting in light of the current crisis over coronavirus, which, which is that um, they were hiding his paralysis at the time. And if that were to happen today, if you were to have a president with polio or with with a real like nowadays polio would not be a fatal disease at the time it was. Um, and, and here he is actually leaning on Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady in 1932, which was, uh, actually, no, this was when he was running for office. So he, this was when he was running for office. He was already suffering from polio and he was leaning on the train balustrade. It says here, um, here again is here again is his, um, is his granddaughter or no this is a daughter of a caretaker at Hyde Park which was his uh, retreat on the Hudson um, here he is apparently th apparently this is him being pushed on a wheelchair to visit someone who was also ill so yeah Roosevelt was hiding his illness and that that's that's one of the things that politicians have hidden its illnesses right and th that's interesting in light of 
Trump falling ill in light of some of these GOP members of the Senate falling ill. Uh, here he is uh, in Arkansas taking therapy. But So th that's one thing he hid. Now, then there was George H.W. Bush. Um, and he <laughs> apparently he, he was... He, uh, this was something that that people that people make a big deal out of. That at, at a certain point, this is a famous photo where he found there appar like there was a barcode scanner, and people say, "Oh, he was he was uh, stunned by it." Let me see here. He was in Florida yesterday talking to a meeting of the national. So th this is funny. At the time, they said, "Oh, he he was." He was stunned that there's a such thing as a barcode scanner. Grocers Association, he called opponents of his economic plan professional pessimists. And he took a line from an ad campaign saying that reports that the economy has fallen and can't get up are just bunk. The president also got a chance to see a supermarket mm -hmm. checkout scanner in action. Kind of seemed as though he'd never really seen one of those before. Yeah, and the president said that he was amazed. So it turns out that that's not really what happened. Apparently, he was just being shown some of the different products by National Cash Register, which is a, I think they still exist. They're they're sort of one of these merchant services corporations. And the truth is that that you know I I could never be accused of being a big Bush supporter of either the Bush presidents, even though I was probably six years old when president when the older President Bush was in office. But that was bullshit. Um, he, he didn't actually feel amazed at it. He was just looking at this exhibition by these people. And apparently they were talking about something and he said something is amazing. It, it had nothing to do with the barcode scanner. Um, but the, the this was used in order to show that he's out of touch, that he's never been to a place where average Americans are. Um, and then you have Pete Buttigieg. So... He he was um, basically fighting during the primary in order to avoid um, in order to avoid black voters rejecting him for their homophobia and and this these are some of the headlines okay opinion Washington Post the ugly lie about black voters and Pete Buttigieg opinion one month later what Bo Bo Pete Buttigieg really said about being gay. Boston Globe, November 5th. Pete Buttigieg has little black support. Don't blame homophobia. Um, New York Times, opinion. Stop blaming black homophobia for Buttigieg's uh, poor results or something. Um, here's here's one article. We'll read it from the Provincetown Independent, which is sure to be full of uh, a lot of gay shit because it's gay. Uh, Provincetown, a uh, uh, fun, funny story. I think I might have brought it up one time because there was a story about the coronavirus there. When I was a kid, my dad took us to Provincetown to see the whales. Uh, so it was me, my dad, my stepmom, and my brother and sister. It was the gayest place I've ever been. Uh, it was uh, basically, I was laughing the entire time very inappropriately. And my, eventually my dad had to tell me to shut the fuck up. Because it was, I was like cracking so many jokes, and and he was afraid like some of the gay people would be. I think I was maybe like 13 years old at the time, and I was just like, um, you know, it it was pro like it was basically, at the time I think I was already watching South Park, and I just thought it was the funniest shit that you just have like, like these dudes dressed up like the village people walking around everywhere. So, it says here. Buttigieg is not popular with African-American voters, and African-American voters are a crucial demographic in democratic politics. The reason blacks haven't joined the Buttigieg juggernaut may, may presume is homophobia. Black churches, which have historically fueled the civil rights movement and are integral to African-American political power, have not been enthusiastic supporters of LGBT rights. Many queer people assume that Buttigieg's black detractors will be the cause of his downfall in the primary and that homophobia homophobia is behind it 
But is that assumption justified? Are black churches, especially in the South, any more homophobic than white churches are? Aren't black voters wary of Buttigieg because of his record with the African American community in South Bend, Indiana, where he is mayor? Isn't it possible that black voters don't yet see Buttigieg's candidacy as representing their interests? Don't they have the capacity to change their minds? Um. So. You know, then the guy goes on, he's like, uh, growing up in the suburbs of New York City, I saw racism fairly regularly in my liberal Jewish milieu. My parents had a portrait of Martin Luther King Jr. in our den, but that didn't stop my grandmother from washing the black maid's dishes twice. Wow, that is pretty racist. In the 1970s, Fairlawn, New Jersey, my hometown, was 99% white and mostly middle class. And across the Passaic River, the city of Patterson was largely black and Puerto Rican and poor. My high school of nearly 2,000 kids had one black student. So, so this person's just going on and on. The bottom line is that, um, no, he, he did not do well. And it was probably very, very much because he was gay. Okay, let, let's not beat around the bush here. Now, why am I mentioning these people? They all had, if you're talking about FDR and the paralysis and, and George H.W. Bush, and the notion that he's he's this patrician snob, and then you 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 have uh, Pete Buttigieg being gay and, and that being a vulnerability, especially with the black community. Kamala Harris has many 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 character flaws that people don't like about her. She's very effete and um, self confident, you know so, you know in an arrogant sort of way. And has very little self-awareness about her flaws. And she just seems to be extreme. She's a panderer. She seems to have very little true. Um, she, she has she has almost no real depth to her character. It's almost as if she was created in order to run for office and wield power. Not in order to be a real human being. And... Um, you can see it from the way she runs her campaign. And uh, the fact is that she's not necessarily been tested in electoral races. Now, she did have a tough race in her first election for California Attorney General against a Republican. But that, that first of all, most people don't pay attention to the Attorney General race. It's not well broadcast. It's, it's, it's not really covered by the press. And she won a tough race, but it wasn't a race that was generally one that's that's in the spotlight. So as, since then, she's been generally skating on the strength of, of living in a very liberal state and serving in, in a capacity that doesn't necessarily attract too many headlines on the national level. That was when she was attorney general. And now, now that she's in the Senate, she just gets very very good media coverage but when people actually see who she is they, they just despise her uh in fact when she was first elected to the senate in 2016 she wasn't even running against a republican because the state's jungle primary system allows for the top two spots to advance doesn't matter what party they are in the primary so the second largest vote getter was another democrat loretta sanchez and uh she beat her pretty handily too uh, both in the primary and in the general election. So Kamala Harris has basically had a pretty easy path to, um, you know, to the Senate. And then when she actually went into the primary on the national level, she had to contend with the fact that the rest of the country is not like California. She did very, she was not well received in the early states, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, even though People were saying, oh, she's a woman of color. She's going to get a huge percentage of the black vote. None of that materialized at all. In fact, she attempted to attack Biden on race. And, yeah, she cut into his um, she cut into his proportion of the black vote for a brief moment. And, and I wouldn't even say it was the black vote. I would say that a lot of these liberal people started to – liberal white people maybe, like the Provincetown guy. So so a lot of those people suddenly defected. They're like, oh, 
you know, Kamala Harris, she, she pointed out that Biden's racist, so we, we can't vote for him. And immediately when she was when she was attacked by Tulsi Gabbard successfully and she couldn't respond and she had no well, she tried to respond, but she didn't really respond to what Gabbard said. She just responded by taking personal shots at Tulsi Gabbard. All of that, all that quick support instantly evaporated. It reflexively returned and and to other candidates because people realized, oh, we, we, we have a dud on our hands. She's not really a sophisticated person. She can't answer questions. She can only pose them. And uh, I think with Coney Barrett's nomination and her being on the Senate Judiciary Committee, it's going to be a very serious problem um, for her because she's not actually the great prosecutor that people have said that she is. Okay, this is something... So the media, so the Democrats have only one precaution available to them in order to avoid this humiliation: ask Harris to remove herself from the com- confirmation hearings on the pretext that she needs to concentrate on campaigning. The immediate response to this proposal would be: Isn't this the opposite of what she should do? Wouldn't the confirmation hearings give Harris an opportunity to showcase her real rhetorical skills, honed as a prosecutor? As a prosecutor, sorry. But that's exactly the point. In 2018, Americans got a taste of her skills during the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation hearings, and she was a flop. One need not be a practicing attorney or legal scholar to understand why, and I'm not. While the media and Twitter psychophants fawned over her domineering and hostile questioning of the nominee, many viewers found her to be tedious as she repeatedly asked Kavanaugh whether he had discussed Robert Mueller, the Robert Mueller investigation with a lawyer from the same firm as one of Donald Trump's defense attorneys, Mark Kasowitz. So we'll we'll actually watch this, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Have you ever discussed special counsel Mueller or his investigation with anyone? Well, it's uh, in the news every day. Have you discussed it with anyone? Uh, With other judges, I know. Uh, Have you discussed Mueller or his investigation with anyone at Kasowitz, Benson, and Torres, the law firm founded by Mark Kasowitz, President Trump's personal lawyer? Uh, Be sure about your answer, sir. uh, Well, I'm not remembering, but if you have something you want to... Are you certain you've not had a conversation with anyone at that law firm? Kasowitz, Benson... Kasowitz, Benson, and yeah. Torres, which is the law firm founded by Mark Kasowitz, yeah. who is President Trump's personal lawyer. Are you, have you had any conversation about Robert Mueller or his investigation with anyone at that firm? Yes or no? Well, is there a person you're talking about? I'm asking you a very direct question, yes or no. I, I need to know the... I'm not sure I know everyone who works at that law firm. I don't think you need to. I think you need to know who you talked with. Who'd you talk to? I don't think I, I, I'm not remembering. So this was, so she was trying to do a cat and mouse thing, but it didn't really work because, and I think I might've gone into this a different time. So if I'm repeating myself, sorry, but um, the fact is that law firms apparently can be very, very large, right? And you hear about some of these law firms. I, I live in Cleveland. There's apparently a law firm downtown called Jones Day, which is massive. As I, from what I hear, it's thousands of attorneys and lawyers. So you're not going to know the names of all of the lawyers and attorneys there. And in fact, many of those people end up, uh, you know, they end up burning out and going into something else because there's just too much competition within the law firm. Uh, they might go strike out on their own, or they might leave the law pro- practice entirely because it's just too competitive and too much work remembering but i'm, I'm happy to be refreshed or if you want to tell me who you're thinking so are, you, works. I, are you saying that with all that you remember you have an impeccable memory you've been speaking for almost eight hours i think more with this committee about all sorts of things you remember yeah. how can you not remember whether or not you had a conversation about robert Mueller or his investigation with anyone at that law firm this investigation has only been going on for so long, sir. So right, I'm not sure I do. I, I, I'm just trying to think. Do I know anyone who works at that firm? I might know. Have Ed you Mc- had? A, that's not my question. My question is: Have you had a conversation with anyone at that firm about that investigation? 
It's a really specific question. I would like to know the person you're thinking of, because what if there's I think you're thinking of someone and you don't want to tell us. Who did you have a conversation with? At I, I am, I'm not going to. Mr. Go. Chairman, I, I, I'd like to raise an objection here. Um, this town is really full of law firms. So, so actually, I, from what I understand, you're not supposed to raise objections in the Senate, but this is funny. Law firms are full of people. First of all, I'd like you to pa on. pause the clock. He Thank you. The clock is paused. Thank you. Pause the clock. Let me raise the my objection. Recognized. This town is full of law firms. Law firms are full of people. Law firms have a lot of names. There are a lot of people who work at a lot of law who firms. So you guys are, might remember and this happened like every single moment during the Kavanaugh hearing. So we're probably going to see a little bit more of this. Senator Lee, I, on that point, um, <clears throat> law firms abound in this town, and there are a lot of them. They're constantly metastasizing. They break off. They form new firms. They're like uh, rabbits. They spawn new firms. <laughs> there is no possible way we can expect this witness. So the guy behind him is breaking up laughing. Uh, I don't know if it's may, maybe Mike Lee is sounding stupid using that analogy. Maybe it's because he's a lawyer himself and he understands exactly what he's talking about. Maybe, you know, the, but the fact is that nobody is getting anywhere with this line of questioning. To know who populates uh, a, an entire firm that he's... So what I find funny about this part is that so many of them stood up only to sit down because the cops are going to drag this one person out. They're waiting for their moment to st to stand up and get all uh, histrionic. My point of order, Mr. Chairman, is simply this. If, if there are names, if there is a list of names he can be given of the lawyers to whom she, uh, uh, she's referring, I think that's fine. But I think it's unfair to suggest that a an entire law firm should be imputed into the witness's memory when he doesn't know who works at the law firm. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Senator Whitehouse, we had Are you making a, a point of order? Well, Senator Whitehouse, I'm the, uh, trying to figure out what the rules are here because we had a very, very long discussion about whether or not points of order were in order because this is a hearing. And we were told that all of our points of order, Senator Whitehouse, all there, the documents. There, there's never been a, a, a time in the, in the two days where someone's made an inquiry of the chair where the chair hasn't recognized the member for a point of inquiry or a point of order. And I've been recognized now, and I appreciate that. But my point is that if the rule is that nobody on our side can make a point of order, then it ought not to be appropriate for Senator Lee to start making points of order the, after all of ours were summarily Sen Senator silenced White. on the basis that we were in a hearing and not in an executive session. If we've moved out of hearing and into executive session, then I'm more than happy to make motions. Senator Whitehouse, if uh, the mere fact that you're speaking right now means that you've been allowed to make a point of order, the matter that you're talking about yesterday was a motion that the chair said was out of order because it was, it was an adjournment motion that would have required us to be in executive session. Anyone who makes to make it, want to make an inquiry of the chair may do so, uh, but we will limit it to that before we go back to Senator Harris. Very good. That's the right result. Sir, please answer the question. I don't know everyone who works at that law firm, Senator. And have you had any discussion with anyone ever about Bob Mueller and or his investigation? So you said Bob Mueller, or, so have or I ever had a discussion about Bob Mueller? I used to work in the administration with Bob Mueller. What about his investigation? Have you had a conversation? So that, that's, that's pretty funny. So she tried to get him in another trap by asking, well, have you ever had any conversations about Robert Mueller? And he's like, well, how could I not? Because Mueller was appointed by the Bush administration. Kavanaugh served under President Bush. So there's no reason that you could, like, obviously... 
there there might have been some sort of uh, actual interaction between them because Mueller, as the head of the FBI, and um, Kavanaugh, as a member of the White House staff, they probably had some interaction at some point because, of course, uh, Kavanaugh was in he was he was very much involved in a lot of the judicial and criminal justice aspects of the Bush administration, including the Patriot Act, which was one of the reasons I thought Kavanaugh was a poor pick. But um, she she just doesn't get him because he can recognize the ambiguity of the question. Conversation with anyone about his investigation? I'm sure I've talked to fellow judges. Anyone aside from fellow judges? About Bob Mueller? About his investigation, sir. I'll ask again. But so I asked the question just a minute ago. I'm surprised you forgot. Have you had this conversation with anyone about the investigation that Bob Mueller is conducting regarding Russia interference with our election or any other matter? The fact that it's ongoing, it's a topic in the news every day. Um, I talked to, uh, it's, uh, talked to fellow judges about it. It's in our, you know, it's in the courthouse in uh, the District of Columbia. So and I guess, uh, and I'll ask the answer to that is time. yes. So the answer is yes. Okay. And did you talk with anyone at Kasowitz, Benson, and Torres? You, you asked me that. So again, she she's asking the question, and and what's she expecting that he's going to say? Oh yes, yes. I talked to this guy and this guy and this associate and this partner and this part. Like, how is he supposed to now suddenly change his answer so that he just spouts the names of all these people? And I need to know who works there. I think you can answer the question without me giving you a list of all employees of that law firm. Well, actually, I can't. I, Why not? Because I don't know who works there. So that's the only way you would know who you spoke with? I, I want to understand your, your, your response to my question, because it's a very direct one. Did you speak with anyone at that law firm about the Mueller investigation? It's a very direct question. Right. I'd be, I'd be surprised, but I don't know anyone. I don't know if the... I don't know everyone who works at that law firm, so I just want to be careful because your question was and or, so I want to be very literal. That's, that's fine. I'll ask a more direct question if that's helpful to you. Did you speak with anyone at that law firm about Bob, Bob Mueller's investigation? I'm not remembering anything like that, but I want to know a roster of people, and I want to know more. So you're not denying that you've spoken with Well, I, I said I don't remember anything like that. Okay. I'll move on. Okay. Clearly, you're not going to answer the question. So that that was her questioning of, of uh, Kavanaugh. And this is something that people at the time were saying, oh, she really, she put his feet to the fire and everything. That's not really what happened. Um, and the fact is that her, her performance was not as ridiculous as Cory Booker, who went all Spartacus, if you remember. That, that's how he got the nickname Spartacus. But, um, you know, he said, oh, I'm going to have a Spartacus moment here. But the fact is that it was um, it was still, I would say, a weak performance. And de generally, the Democrats during those hearings, and this is why I think it's not as big of an error to the Republicans to decide to go ahead with the hearings. The Republicans are, are going to probably draw a lot of blood from Democratic Senate, um, you know, their Democratic Senate colleagues over the hearings because people are going to really realize who they're potentially putting into office if the Democrats play hardball with Coney Barrett. First of all, because Coney Barrett, whatever one thinks about her, and this is something that I want to bring up too, Coney Barrett doesn't have nearly as much baggage as Kavanaugh had. First of all, she's a woman. No known, uh, you know, incidents of, of uh, sexual assault committed by her. Uh, not that it would probably be uncommon anyway, but um, she's a, she's a, you know, obviously she's a woman. She's married. She has a number of kids, apparently. And she's a strict Catholic, also like Kavanaugh, but you know, with, with, with her, there's just fewer angles for them to attack. And she doesn't have that, um, you know, association with the Bush administration to be attacked either. So 
I would generally say that the Democrats are going to have to figure out exactly how they're going to attack her. And they might they might end up, and this is something that is going to be a real question. Will they decide that it might be in their interest to let her get onto the court in order to prevent in order to do the least damage to their image? Or will they decide to go all scorched earth and say, well, if we lose this court, it means we lose everything. And um, the performance during the Kavanaugh hearings is, is, is one of the reasons that they have such a undesirable position, because in 2018, when those hearings happened, I realize this video is getting a little long, but bear with me. Um, there were 11 members of the Judiciary Committee that were G GOP, and I think that there were 10 that were uh, Democrat. Okay? Um, I can actually look that up. Um, Senate, okay, Senate Judiciary Committee. And at the time, yeah, there were 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 against 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And I think that there was... um. There, there was some sort of, uh, okay, there were 10 on the Democratic side. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So, in any case, so the Democrats ended up losing a seat on the committee because of the Kavanaugh hearings, because the Democrats did worse in 2018. Even though they flipped the House, they lost two seats in the Senate and they ended up losing one of the one of the seats that are is on the judiciary committee they had to give up that was the one i believe occupied by um let me see here i guess uh sheldon whitehouse is no longer on the committee so or no yes he is so who did they lose oh al franken so so al franken ended up having to um so his seat was vacated and uh, that that is really one of the reasons that they're just a weaker party right now, because you, you just have, especially in the Senate. So the Republicans are going to be able to basically play, you know, play nice with Coney Barrett and the Democrats have to go on the offensive. They have to draw blood. And who are they going to have to turn to if Kamala Harris is still on the committee in order to draw blood? It's not going to be some of these other can like uh, older committee members like Diane Feinstein and Patrick Leahy who are both in their 80s. It's not going to be Dick Durbin and Chris Coons and Sheldon Whitehouse who just haven't been, you know, they're, they're not very interesting people at all. Dick Durbin, if you listen to him, and I actually listened to a committee hearing last week, the, the Comey hearing, he's just a very boring guy. I'm not going to say I, I, he's, he's, he's annoying. I'm not going to say he's an asshole. But Dick Durbin is a very the, the senator from Illinois is just a very boring politician. He's he doesn't say much that's very interesting at all. Uh, I don't know why people vote for him. I'm pretty sure it might be because people in Illinois just vote habitually for the person who is a Democrat, and that's just the way it is. So they're going to have to turn to someone who is, um, you know, able to start some fireworks now. Um, Sheldon Whitehouse is a clown. Uh, he, in 2018, during the Kavanaugh hearing, he highlighted this issue where the word boofing appeared on Kavanaugh's high school yearbook, or, or it might have been um, his calendar. And he was like, well, does that mean some sort of weird sexual game or something? Some sort of uh, disgusting sexual act? And he's like, no, that just means like farts. And White House just kept, uh, you know, talking about it. And it's like, dude, maybe focus on something that's actually important. Now, the other pe people that are possibly um, on the com they're, that they're going to be on the committee and they're going to they might do something embarrassing are Cory Booker and Amy Klobuchar. Actually, I think they might have is Co Booker on this. He's still on the committee. So, yes. Um, so those two 
Cory Booker and and uh, Amy Klobuchar, I don't think that they're really going to. They might actually, you know, grandstand and things like that, but they're not really going to go hard on this because both of them are are I believe they know that they don't have much to gain personally from it. Maisie Hirono is somebody who doesn't care. She's on the committee, and she's famous for telling men that they need to sh- shut up and step up. <laughs> So, so that that that's what she said during the Kavanaugh hearing. Um, so it's going to have to be Kamala Harris, and and if she really is put into that position where she has to be the attack, uh, you, you know, she has to be the point person on this attack, I think she's going to fall apart. And one of the reasons is that people will start to realize that this is a person. She is. Um, she she she's simply you know she she's of ambiguous religion she's baptist and hindu she's married to a jewish lawyer right um she has a checkered history as uh willie brown's mistress and uh it's it's just like people people look and see through this and they're like what what is the deal with this woman attacking Coney Barrett, who is much more of, she has much of a, more of a squeaky clean personality. And I know some people are going to, they're going to react to what I said or what people are inevitably going to say and say, that's, that's just racist. These white women, they're always portraying themselves to be more virtuous than the woman of color or whatever. If you look at Kamala Harris's record and put it next to Amy Coney Barrett's record, Amy Coney Barrett has done much less to negatively impact the lives of, um, you know, black people or Latinos than uh, Kamala Harris has. She, you know, Kamala Harris was basically, you know, a slave driver in the California penal system. She was trying to fight in order to allow inmates to continue to be used as firefighters for pennies on the dollar against wildfires she was fighting in order to basically deny uh justice to a lot of these death row inmates that had exculpatory evidence denied um you know at trial and things like that excluded at trial um and 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 people just know when they see something like this that that they don't trust one person they're not going to trust kamala harris after she goes on some sort of tirade against Coney Barrett, um, and and these are some these are some things that I think could happen if she's allowed to do this, which I think that the Democrats might be dumb enough to let her do, be, become this uh, prosecutor of somebody who's done nothing to warrant that type of uh, of criticism. So they'll start to run attack ads where they say. Kamala Harris thinks this is how you talk to a federal judge. Is this the person you want on deck when Joe Biden calls it quits? Does Kamala Harris think the church you worship is at is a disqualifier? How can she claim to represent all Americans? If Kamala Harris treats public officials this way about their beliefs, how do you expect her to respect the Bill of Rights for average Americans like you? And I think it, it is something that is unfair for Kamala Harris to some degree. This is this is where I try to, to you know I try to hedge on the other side. Mike Pence does not have to deal with this. Mike Pence basically, first of all, he's in the catbird seat. He's now looked at as the potential successor because of Donald Trump being in, in sort of a healthcare scare with the coronavirus. Um, he's more level headed. He is going to be debating her this week. And I think that, you know, I was just talking to someone earlier. And she agreed with me. I, I said that Mike Pence is just a very stoic and reserved personality. It's really the opposite issue with him that it is for Donald Trump. Like you, you, you can't really get him to behave in an in a outrageous manner. That's one of the reasons I think Trump decided, yeah, this might be the guy because he seems just much more of a, you know, just a reserved personality able to control his emotions and control the, you know, just a very well modulated tone of voice. And Kamala Harris isn't, she's, she's just a very, she, she could very well do poorly in the debate. Now I recognize that going into the first debate, 
the first presidential debate, people were saying, oh, Joe Biden's going to flame out. He's going to implode and everything. And it didn't really happen that way, even though it could have if, if Donald Trump would have allowed him to hang himself. I think that Kamala Harris, she's going to have a much tougher time getting Joe, getting Mike Pence to sh sweat than she would have with Donald Trump. In fact, I, th I think, you know, it's it's an it's a much harder matchup for her going up against Pence, who, who's just like Coney Barrett. He's just much more of a, you know, you know, just just a cold personality, right? You just, you, how are you supposed to penetrate that? And, uh, he doesn't say ridiculous things that people look at as clownish, right? Uh, because the media is really focusing on things right now that are really irrelevant in order to keep her from being exposed for who she really is to the, to the voters. Mo I think most of the voters don't really like her and they're trying to keep her from being uh, focus of the media. You see what I mean? The media is trying to keep her from being their focus because they don't want to address that the fact that she's not nearly as endeared to the public as she is to them. So they're talking about her husband. They're talking about her favorite living rapper. This is something... So Angela Rye asked her this question I think the last last week she asked her who Kamala's favorite living rapper is. And she said Tupac, even though he's been dead since 1996. And they've also made a, a huge deal out of her Converse sneakers or Chuck Taylors. This is something they've talked about over and over and over again. They talked about it when she was running for president in the primary and nobody cared about it. And now they're talking about her sneakers again. Um, so. Um, and they're, they're also apparently not taking questions some days after 9 a.m. So my conclusion is this, okay? Does she tr sometimes try to, you know, really go after the hard goals, the, the hard targets, not go for the low-hanging fruit? I think sometimes she does. And I think when she went into that Kavanaugh hearing, she really wanted to show that she could rattle this guy. And, and I don't think it worked. And I think the, the, the evidence of the fact that she's been a failure is that while at, at the time, at the time you can actually see that they gave a lot of um, favorable press coverage to it, including a Daily Show segment that had 3.9 million views. Nowadays, they're not talking about the Kavanaugh hearing. They're not talking. And this was her moment to shine, right? This was something that was viewed by many, many, many people for a while, including TYT. They say Kavanaugh twists under Kamala Harris grilling. Well, it didn't really do anything. Nobody really, um, nobody, nobody actually was affected by it because there was just a saturation. First of all, there was a saturation of material about this. And uh, I think people are starting to realize that she's just not quite the person that the media wants her to be. So that's about it. Please like, share, and subscribe. Also, I want to remind you to subscribe to me on all the other social media platforms. So those are, uh, and I said these at the beginning, so of course, Minds.com and Subscribestar and Gab, as well as Parlor. But as far as videos, I really want to encourage you to join me on both BitChute and Library, and hopefully as well on Rumble, even though I'm still having trouble uploading some videos.